Welcome everyone. Today we're here with the Johnson County Task Force on Aging. My name is Sean Zerke. I'm the chair of the Task Force on Aging for Johnson County. And we've invited Pam Railsback, who is the uh, long-term care ombudsman for the state of Iowa. Uh, we are having to do this uh, via video because uh, right now the state of Iowa has funding for a long-term care ombudsman, but does not have funding for a travel budget. Um, and Pam can talk a little bit more about the specifics of why um, she's unable to uh, do a large component of the job she was hired to do, which is face-to-face -face, um, advocacy uh, for her um, clients. And but I do want to welcome Pam with us today uh, via via Google Hangouts, and she does have a presentation planned for us. So, uh, Pam, if you'd start by introducing your, yourself and a little bit of your background and why you're passionate about this, um, just prior to getting into your presentation, that would be great. Yes, definitely. Thank you for having me, and thank you for allowing the all the technology instead of somewhat in person. So. Um, I appreciate that. So yes, I'm Pam Railsback and I am the local long-term care ombudsman for Johnson County and I have uh, six other counties that I go to. All of the long-term care facilities, residential care facilities, um, assisted living. So I'll go to all of those places as well. Used to when I used to travel. So which I'll talk about here shortly. Um, but uh, I just realized it's been going to be 10 years this month that I've been a long-term care ombudsman. I can't believe it. Time has flown. Um, but previous to that, I was a long-term care social services director at a facility, a nursing facility in Johnson County. So um, did that for eight years. So been around for a couple decades already. Time flies when you're having fun. But uh, anyway, I found my passion, obviously, in, long, in the long-term care field. And when I applied for the ombudsman position, I thought, oh, there's no way I'm going to get it. And I was kind of thinking, well, maybe I'll, I'll become a long-term care administrator, thinking, well, I'd be able to affect more people and make change and, and improve things for more for more folks. So I applied for the ombudsman thing thinking, oh, you know, it would be really cool, but I kind of had my administrators uh, pooling in, in line. So I ended up getting this position and I've been here ever since and it's been wonderful. Uh, just making a difference every day. Um, what I what I miss for sure is just going out and seeing the residents and the tenants who live in the long-term care facilities, many of which who don't have anybody who just sits down and talks to them and gets to know them and, um, you know, just having those relationships. It's, I really miss that part. And I know there are frequent callers that I have who still call me, of course, um, even though I'm not there to see them. But you know, they miss the face-to-face -face and, and you can't blame them. Um, it does present kind of a challenge too when you're working with folks who are hard of hearing or maybe someone who has some form of dementia and perhaps over the phone, they're not that great as far as understanding what you're trying to say. But in person, you know, seeing someone in person is so much easier to understand and to follow the conversation and use the social cues that people use, um, you know, during those conversations too. So. It's been challenging without our without our wheels. So, and as Sean said, yes, there have been some cuts to our office. Um, we found out in a little bit before July 1st that we were going to be cut $500,000, which uh, our office was very small. We had we had only 17 staff at that point, and right now we have 14 staff. Uh, one person retired. One person left to uh, further her schooling, and currently we have uh, the state ombudsman position open. So that we're currently seeking a state, uh, new state ombudsman. So, uh, but you know our biggest expenses are salaries. So, uh, of course, we didn't want to cut staff because then that would hurt even more the the folks in Iowa who live in long term care. So. Our travel budget was the second biggest budget that we had, and, and that's what we had to cut. So while we can't travel, um, of course we're able to do you know technology like we're doing today, uh, phone calls, emails. Um, we have volunteer ombudsmen, which are amazing. I love my volunteers. Um, and right now they're the boots on the ground, ground folks. You know they're they're there in the facilities, and I love always and always have loved reaching out to my 
my volunteers to say, hey, I can't make it out to this facility, but I received a phone call from a couple individuals. Would you mind checking it out? And so we're just doing that a little bit more than we had before. Um, on the upside, I did have a really busy month in August. I had all kinds of phone calls and, and, and issues that I was able to resolve um, by phone. So I think we're still able to do the, the work, the good work that we've done before. It's just different. You know, in a perfect world, would I love to have our cars back? Of course. Um, it's so much easier to, you know, be able to go out and, and see for myself what's happening. Um, there have been situations where we're not able to resolve concerns because we're not able to go to a facility and we are documenting every single one of those so that we can present those examples to the legislators um, in the coming legislative session. Um, for example, one issue I wasn't able to resolve was a family member called me. Uh, her mom is at the facility. Uh, she applied for a job at the facility and didn't get it, so she already didn't like the administrator very much. And then secondly, the administrator was bothering her about paying the bill for her mom at the long-term care facility. So her claim was, oh, all the residents don't like the administrator, and they're saying that he doesn't listen to their complaints and, and whatever. So um, it's always good to get more information so that would be a prime example of when i would go out to the facility and talk to other residents find out if truly other residents are having concerns with the administration with the administrator specifically and figure out what i can do to help so um, that was one issue you know department of inspections and appeals and they're the regulatory folks they wouldn't have gone out to check into that because there really weren't any concrete violations that the administrator it was or wasn't doing. Um, so that would be kind of more of an in-between, which is where the ombudsman falls into, hey, there's a problem here, but maybe it's not a regulatory violation. So in those you know, gray areas, those are issues that we can go in and, and check into. So of course I had to tell the family member, well, can't go in and these are the reasons why. But I did encourage her, you know, if we have residents who are passionate or able to talk on the phone, please have them give me a call because I would certainly be glad to gather whatever information I could via phone. So that's a little bit about our our change in the way that we do business. So sure. Well I think I'll go ahead and start our presentation. All right. Does everything look good on your end? It does. Thank you very much. Great. Good deal. So I'm just going to talk a bit more about uh, our office. And a little bit first about our office's structure. Uh, we do have a state ombudsman, and as I mentioned before, uh, Deanna Klingen Fisher was our former state ombudsman, and she left at the beginning of August, so it's been about a month since she's been gone. So we have an open position, and Cindy Peterson is currently our interim state ombudsman, and uh, she also covers the involuntary discharge uh, specialist position. So she's has a lot to juggle right now. Um, so we're currently hiring for that. Uh, we do have eight local long-term care ombudsmen, so seven others like me who um, you know, work directly with the residents and the families and the facilities and work to make things better for the residents. And we do have a policy coordinator and legislative liaison, and her name is Lindsay Kenworthy. She's out right now, now on maternity leave, just had a baby boy. We do have a managed care program coordinator, Kelly Todd, and man two managed care ombudsmen, Kelly Zan sorry, Kelsey Zanting and Pam Hegel, in addition to our administrative assistant, Kate, assistant Katie. So as you can see, our office is not big by any means. So here's a map that kind of shows the territories that each ombudsman covers. And I'm number six, I'm in the purple. So I have seven. Um, they kind of uh, tailored these territories uh, based on number of complaints and activities. So uh, the smaller territories like Polk, obviously, uh, is a bit, you know, big city, Des Moines, lots of facilities, a big concentration of long-term care facilities in that area. So complaints in Polk County, those were always the highest in the state. So we just have one ombudsman designated just for Polk. Um, and so that's kind of the reasoning behind the, how, why the map looks like it looks. Um, for Region 9, we have some rotating coverage for that area. 
Um, last legislative session, we had hoped to ask for another ombudsman to cover that area. Um, but sadly, instead of getting uh, more funding for staff, we uh, suffered some reductions. So we currently have uh, an ombudsman you know, rotating for four months coverage with one ombudsman and then it switches to a different one. So uh, whoever's covering region nine has their territory plus region nine. So you can imagine they stay pretty busy. So I thought I'd start talking a little bit about the long-term care ombudsman. Um, the biggest question I always get is what is a long-term care ombudsman? Um, people can barely say the word, let alone know what it means. So uh, to kind of simplify things, I always tell folks, I'm, I'm just an advocate. An ombudsman is just a fancy word for advocate. I'm an advocate for you, you know, residents and tenants who live in long-term care facilities. And when asked, well, what is an advocate? Then I say, well, we work to address concerns or problems, you know, relating to your health, safety, welfare, or life. So that's a little bit of what we do. And just to make the distinction, our office is different from the Department of Inspections and Appeals, and they're the folks who regulate the nursing homes. They're the ones that go out and annually inspect nursing homes or go out on complaints. They investigate abuse um, and things like that. And we are different from them. We don't have any ability to give fines or citations like Department of Inspections and Appeals does. Um, what we do, we kind of work in the gray. You know, maybe the facility is providing you know, the meals they're required to provide along with alternates, but maybe the meals don't taste very good. You know, they're, they have a lack of seasoning. They have a lack of, they're not hot enough. You know, if there's concerns like that, that really aren't regulation, you know, rule violations, um, our office can go in and kind of address that. And for the meal issues, and I haven't had a, a complaint since July about poor tasting meals, but a lot of times I've been able to go out during a meal service and talk to other residents and find out, hey, how's your meal? You know, what are they normally like? What do you want? You know, what do you want to see on your menus? And, and ask questions like that. Um, there are always people who are very particular and picky about their meals, which is fine, but I like to find out, hey, is this a widespread issue or is this more of an issue specific to this certain individual who's calling me? So that's just an example of uh, our differences between our office and inspections and appeals. So throughout the presentation, I'm going to be talking about residents and tenants. And just to make things less confusing, I thought it might be good to provide some definitions. So a resident, um, per the Iowa Code, is someone who resides and receives services in a licensed long-term care facility. So that could include a nursing facility or a residential care facility. And a tenant is someone who receives services through a program like an assisted living program or an elder group home. So I'll be using resident and tenant, so that way you kind of know the distinction, the difference. So um, you're probably wondering how did the long-term care ombudsman's office come to be? Well, the Older Americans Act uh, from 1965 promoted the dignity of older Americans through providing services and supports so that folks can remain independent in their community. Because of course that's what everybody wants. Nobody says, oh, when I get older, I wanna go to a nursing home. Everybody wants to stay in their homes as long as they possibly can. Um, so the Older Americans Act helped to develop programs like home delivered meals, case management services, transportation, um, the senior center services, in addition to the ombudsman services who could provide the advocacy for folks residing in long-term care. So that's, what, that's where we fall into the Older Americans Act. And there are some rules um, about our office that allow us, um, you know, give us our direction on what we do. So the Older Americans Act does allow us to have private access to long-term care facilities and residents and tenants. Um, so that means we can enter any time. There have been instances where uh, perhaps there was a complaint called to our office that, hey, I'm being, I'm being awakened at two o'clock in the morning to give my bath. And I don't wanna wake up at two o'clock in the morning to have my bath, which I can't blame them. So because we have unimpeded access to facilities, we had an ombudsman who went into the facility at two o'clock in the morning. And sure enough, 
we saw that they were giving baths to folks at two o'clock in the morning. Um, this was unbeknownst to the director of nursing. So of course, you know, we brought this to her attention and that was stopped immediately. But it was nice for us to be able to have that ability to go in during that off hour, you know, and I have made visits to facilities, um, again, back when we had cars, uh, to facilities on weekends when they said, oh, staffing's horrible on the weekends, or the meal is really bad, um, you know, supper time on Sunday. You know, I, I have the ability to go and make visits during that time to see for myself if that's true and to get some feedback from other tenants and residents at that time as well. So we have the ability to do that. We also have access, um, well, I guess it's important to mention as I have before that right now we can't go to the facilities because we don't have the money for travel. However, we do have access through you know, phone and technology measures like Google Hangout, um, FaceTime and things like that. And we, I have been a part of care plan meetings via a conference call and uh, have been you know, using technology as and phone as much as possible. So we like to think of that instead of like telemedicine, we're more like teleadvocacy. Uh, so that's kind of what we're what we're forced to do to do right now. Um, and I think it's important to mention it's not like doing business over the phone. Phone is a foreign concept. Um, the involuntary discharge specialist would primarily do all of her business by phone, following up with folks who received a notice saying they had 30 days to move out of the facility. She would primarily, you know, call the facilities and call the residents and handle that by phone. Um, and same with the man managed care ombudsman program. Uh, they do all of their business by phone as well. There are many times when I have been able to handle cases and casework by phone, even before we lost our cars. So again, it's not that we uh, aren't helping people. Uh, we are, it's just not maybe to the extent that we had hoped, that we had hoped to or would hope to. So um, ombudsmen also have access to review uh, medical and social residents of residents and tenants if necessary to resolve a problem. And whenever there is a situation where records need to be result, uh, reviewed, we always ask the resident or tenant and get their permission. Um, there are cases and situations where maybe the resident or tenant could not give us permission, in which case we can talk with the decision maker to get permission. Um, otherwise, if there are concerns with the decision maker not making appropriate decisions, uh, then we do have the option to, and the ability to look at the records without permission. Um, but we always think it's, you know, dignity and respect wise, you know, it's best to have permission. Ombudsmen also have access to administrative records, policies, and documents. Um, so we do frequently ask for copies of policies or copies of admission agreements, you know, whatever the issue is about. So we have access to that as well. Um, and same with licensing and certification records uh, maintained by the state. And when I say the state, usually that's the Department of Inspections and Appeals. And we do have a great relationship with them. Um, you know, we talk with their surveyors, they contact our office every time they go into a facility, which is great because we let them know that, hey, we've heard that there have been some issues with baths in this facility or the call lights really seem to be slow around second shift. And because I'm not able to go out there right now, I haven't been able to validate this. So we are able to partner with the Department of Inspections and Appeals. And I know at least I personally have been submitting more complaints to the Department of Inspections and Appeals just because I haven't been able to get out and investigate the issue myself. So, and the Ombudsman, we are considered an oversight agency by HIPAA, which is very helpful. And it allows the facility staff to share information from the chart, share information about you know, verbally about a person's social history or situation that they're dealing with so that we can get all of the information in order to know what's occurring and what needs to happen in order to resolve it. So we are a health oversight agency. So facilities can freely share information without violating HIPAA. So I thought it might be good to talk about the functions of the ombudsman. And again, our primary goal is to identify, investigate, and resolve complaints made by or on behalf of residents and tenants. Again, right now we're doing this by phone and technology. 
um, unless I have a, a resident advocate or sorry, a, a volunteer ombudsman who's able to go out and make a visit, uh, you know, I certainly go that route too, if that's a possibility. And uh, with resident and tenant permission, we do make referrals to, you know, licensing, certifying, and enforcement agencies just to ensure that abuses are addressed and correction corrective actions are taken. Um, so that might include making a complaint to the Department of Inspections and Appeals on behalf of a resident, which I've, I, I do routinely. Um, the Ombudsman, we also inform resident and tenants about means of obtaining services offered by other providers or agencies. So maybe if someone's looking to leave the facility and move back into the community, you know, hooking them up with someone from the Area Agency on Aging might be just just the referral that they need. So we always provide information for other organizations that might be able to help them obtain their goals. We also provide services to assist residents or tenants in protecting their health, safety, welfare, and rights. So what we always try to do is empower the resident to, you know, encourage them to talk with the staff. You know, a lot of times we're hearing this concern, but yet they haven't talked to anybody from the staff. And I'm forever saying, well, they can't fix it if they don't know about it. So if we can, you know, pro provide assurance and try to empower the residents to go to the staff and talk to them about their concern, you know, we're just making, mending the fences where we want successful communication between the residents and the facilities because they are better able to work together instead of bringing in a third party who doesn't know the full story they're better able to work together to resolve the concerns. If the resident's not comfortable with that, then we might offer, okay, well, bring in your phone and I'll be on the phone with you as you talk to the administrator and I'll back you up and I'll be there for support. If that's not an option or if the resident's not comfortable with that, um, the third option might be to have just the ombudsman contact the management. And I would work this out with the management and then I would get back to the resident or tenant and let them know the outcome of that conversation. So we always try to empower residents, that's always the goal. But we also follow the residents' direction. So whatever they're comfortable with is the route that we take. We, the Ombudsman also ensures that residents and tenants have regular access to our office. Um, we do represent interests of the resident and tenants before governmental agencies and do seek administrative or legal remedies in order to protect health, safety, welfare, and rights. And we do provide administrative and technical assistance to our local and volunteer long-term care ombudsman. Ombudsmen also educate and inform consumers and the general public regarding issues and concerns related to long-term care and facilitate public comments on laws, regulations, policies, and actions. I'm not sure if any of you know, but Department of Human Services has asked the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, to um, end the three-month retroactive coverage period that they currently offer for folks who are going on Medicaid when they live in a long-term care facility, like a nursing facility. So by doing so, our office's position is that that would be very detrimental to the folks living in long-term care. We fear that folks who don't already have Medicaid as their payment source might not be able to transition from the hospital into the nursing facility because they don't have that payment source already set up. And there are some situations where maybe someone hasn't been able to pay their bill for six months. So they have six months worth of private pay bills built up before Medicaid starts. At least with the three month retroactive period, Medicaid can pay the three months, you know, three months prior to the date they were approved. And that has been a real big incentive for facilities to keep, you know, retain the residents or even take a chance on taking someone without a, a payment source from the hospital. I, our fear is that perhaps, you know, the resources that pay for the hospital care, you know, those will be taxed, those will be drained um, because facilities will be reluctant to take folks without that payment source, with that, without that three month retroactive period. So we are not in favor of that. Um, the change is slated to, to start October 1st if uh, CMS approves Iowa's request for the waiver to get that ended. So, um, but I did certainly pass along that information when the comment period was open so that other facilities could also contribute comments or other advocacy organizations that I'm a part of. 
So that's just one example. We do that all the time though. We do also advocate for changes, of course, to improve resident and tenants quality of life and care. Um, I've advocated for a policy change in a residential care facility when uh, a resident had a thyroid uh, surgery and she returned to the facility and only had Tylenol for pain. Um, obviously that was not enough to manage her pain. And of course this happened on a Friday over the weekend and then I was back on Monday. And that was when I received the phone call saying, hey, I just had the surgery and the facility wouldn't allow me to have the pain medication that my doctor ordered. So by Monday, she was already, you know, not as much doing well, the Tylenol was working and she really didn't need the, the pain medication at that point. But that opened up a discussion for me to have with the facility about, tell me about your policies regarding medication. And it came to my attention that they pretty much didn't allow any pain medication other than Tylenol, even in the doctor's order. And that was because a lot of their folks are on, you know, drugs for me their mental illnesses and they were worried about, you know, conflicts and counter actions between the medications and things like that. But I was able to work with them and convince them to work with their medical director to create a pain policy so that there was something in place for them to follow should someone have a surgery or have a special situation where they needed pain medication. So later on, the same resident, she had all of her teeth removed because she needed dentures. So we talked with the facility, I talked to her, we made sure that the facility's pain policy was in effect and that they were willing to accept a, an order from her dentist in order to get some pain medication. And afterwards, uh, she said the surgery went fine and she got her pain medication and she wasn't miserable like she was with her thyroid. So advocating for changes to policies and things like that, it really does make a difference for the residents. So ombudsmen also train, educate, support, and monitor our volunteers. Um, our volunteers submit monthly reports to us so we keep up on what's going on through those. Um, I think I've already kind of mentioned, we analyze, comment on, and monitor development of laws and uh, provide training and also support programs um, in the development of resident and family councils. And usually the, the point of resident family councils is to protect the well-being and the rights of the residents and tenants. Um, these groups of residents or families are typically created to help resolve issues during the facility or of the facility might that might have um, and hopefully develop some sort of a constructive dialogue so that the families can figure out what they can do to support the facility's efforts. And hopefully the facility would be willing to take that feedback and make improvements. Ombudsmen also advocate for changes to improve quality of life and care and coordinate services with uh, legal assistance and elder abuse awareness and prevention programs. Um, seems like quite frequently I'm making referrals to Iowa Legal Aid. Um, I've worked with Martha Quint and Peter Rapids, one of the attorneys who works with Heritage Area Agency on Aging to help with Medicaid applications. Um, she's really great at providing consults with elder abuse type situations too. Um, and our office also participates in interdisciplinary team meetings, which talk about different abuses that are occurring in the community. Um, a lot of those community members who are victims of abuse eventually move into long-term care facilities and often the saga continues when they're in a long-term care facility. So it's helpful for me to kind of have a heads up so that when they contact me, the resident contacts me, I can kind of be aware of, of the past history of the abuse or neglect, whatever the case may be. All of our notes for the ombudsman work, our cases, our activities, phone calls, everything goes into a statewide confidential uniform reporting system. And we're able to run reports and get data out of that to show how many visits we've made, how many phone calls, how many times a facility has called us, how many times a resident has called us. Um, we can you know, run statistics on the highest um, frequency of a complaint that we've received. So um, all of our notes go into that data system and that helps when we create our annual report. We also publicize our office. We have like a monthly newsletter that goes out and uh, we provide uh, 
information to consumers and the public and other agencies about issues relating to long-term care in Iowa. And we do, uh, as mentioned, do the annual report, uh, just kind of reporting an overview of our office and what we've done to help promote the health, safety, welfare, and rights of residents and humans living in long-term care. We do lots of participating in inquiries, meetings, and studies um, that can improve health, safety, welfare, and rights. Um, I do work with a couple University of Iowa researchers who are often looking for a project to in increase. Uh, one project was increasing the um, availability of fresh fruits and vegetables to a school and to a nursing home, thinking that, hey, if we can combine resources, maybe we can get more fresh fruits and vegetables out to a rural area where a school and a nursing home is if both would participate in that program. So. I helped her, you know, provide some feedback on a survey that she wanted facilities to take and provided her with resources on how to get a list of the facilities and, and stuff like that. So we're always willing to, to work on those kinds of things, too. Uh, work a lot with the courts, uh, mental health advocates when there are issues with uh, committals and things like that. And we do ensure confidentiality for everyone, even if someone shares an hour's worth of of concerns, but they say, I don't want you to say anything to anybody about these. We don't. Again, it's always up to the resident or the tenant to decide what we do with the information they've shared with us. If they don't want us to do anything, we don't. So moving on, I thought we could talk about some federal fiscal year 16 facts. We don't have our federal fiscal year 17 facts yet because our federal fiscal year goes through September 30th. So these are the most up-to-date facts that I have at this point. So last year we provided a little over 13,000 program activities. All of those included consulting with, you know, 850 facilities and over 3,000 staff members. We consulted with 14,000 long-term care residents, tenants, and family members. We made almost 700 complaint-related visits and a little over 4,300 non-complaint related visits. We visited almost 3,000 residents, tenants, and tenants on complaint related issues. We provided education, training, and technical assistance to over 11,000 individuals, including our volunteers, facility staff, media, and the community. We participated in 99 facility surveys, and that's when the Department of Inspections and Appeals goes into the facility. You know, we might stop into the facility or talk with the surveyors to say, hey, I have permission from this resident, Mrs. Smith, and she's having X, Y, and Z issues. You know, would you please stop in and talk to her? So we do, again, partner with the Department of Inspections and Appeals in order to resolve issues for the residents. And we also assisted residents and families through participation in and developing of 100 resident and family council meetings. So that's great. We do collaborate, of course, with other organizations, um, serve on task forces and work groups, and of course, partner with the areas, um, area agencies on aging uh, in order to assist folks transitioning from the community to a facility or from a facility back into the community. So I'm going to give you a top five of our complaints. I'm going to start by number five. Um, number fifth, fifth top is issue are issues related to the environment. Number four were issues related to systems and concerns apart from the facility. Number three top complaint was about issues relating to admission, transfer, discharge, and eviction. Number two were issues related to autonomy, choice, exercise of rights and privacy. And the number one complaint were, was issues relating to resident and tenant care. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, regarding resident care, there was a resident who, uh, she was young, and she had multiple sclerosis, and she requested showers three times a week at 7.30 in the morning. She really wanted them before she, breakfast. Um, so she told me, you know, when I met with her, she we kind of penciled out when it what the days that she wasn't getting him, um, you know, some weeks she would, some weeks she wouldn't. And with her permission, her and I both went and met with the director of nursing. And upon comparing this schedule with the director of nursing with the schedule that um, the resident shared with me, 
when she didn't receive the showers, it became apparent that the staffing agency staff were working on those days when she did not receive her showers. So upon you know, our conversation, we identified the issue and the facility ultimately upgraded their staffing agency orientation to include information on routines and schedules. So I, I checked back with this resident, you know, gave the facility some time to do this and checked back with the resident and she said that things had improved. So she was getting her showers three days a week at 7.30 in the morning. So she was happy. Another example of autonomy, choice and rights is a resident with Parkinson's was upset because the facility insisted that they wear a personal alarm all the time. And this was after a fall two months prior to when we got involved. So with the resident permission, the Ombudsman reviewed the past falls and the incident reports. Um, and it appeared from the report that the resident had fallen not long after they were placed on a medication that would uh, promote some, sedation, some sedating effects. So because of that, the medication was then changed to an as needed. And the resident agreed that um, the medication could make him unsteady, but if it was given as needed, um, that they would wear the personal alarm for five hours afterwards. And in order to, you know, not need the personal alarm all, all the time. So the facility felt, well, that's fine. If you want to wear the alarm for five hours after you take this medication, but not wear it other times, they were okay with that. So the personal alarm was removed. So the resident um, that resulted in the resident not having any further falls. And he was so much happier because he didn't have to deal with that alarm. So here's an example of a system issue. Um, a resident was having issues with Medicaid approval. And the issue is that the resident's decision maker, um, new decision maker, had called the ombudsman and I'd gotten permission to speak with the Department of Human Services to find out what information they needed to complete the Medicaid application. Um, this resident was facing discharge because she wasn't able to get on Medicaid. So the resident had dementia and her spouse of one year was not willing to provide the required financial information so that the Medicaid application could be uh, approved. So there was also some concern about financial exploitation by the spouse during the time when the resident lived in the community. And it's interesting to mention that the spouse was also on parole during this time. So DHS came back and said, oh, we just need a letter from an attorney who states that he, you know, that the spouse was not able to provide that information. So we contacted an attorney who offered pro bono services and he wrote up the letter, which we submitted to DHS. So the resident was approved for Medicaid. And, and the, the application was dated back um, effective to the date of admission. So that was amazing. She didn't have to move. So an example of an environmental concern, um, and we get these every year um, when it transitions from, you know, warm to cold or cold to warm. Um, so as it was con contacted an ombudsman one October morning to say that due to the cool weather, the residents were feeling cold and they wanted the heat to be turned on. So they met with uh, the administrator who said, no, there's some warm days coming up. We're just not even going to turn on the heat. So the ombudsman contacted the administrator to talk about this. And the administrator said, well, you know, it's hard on the system to turn the heat on and off and it takes time to warm up and cool down. So he was trying to make uh, excuses as to why they couldn't do that. The ombudsman also asked the administrator to take a picture of the thermostat and email it to her. So um, as a reminder, she said federal regulations require the temps to be between 71 to 81 degrees. So a picture was taken of one of their uh, thermostats and it was set to 62 degrees. So it was determined that the nurses, you know, as they were running around and doing their jobs, that they would get hot. So they'd crank down the the temperature so that they would be comfortable when they were running around. But as a result, the residents were freezing. So this administrator subsequently started the furnace and he did put lock boxes around the thermostat so the staff would not change the temperatures whenever it suited them. Um, so I thought also we could talk about additional positions and functions. Uh, discharge specialist is one of our functions and Cindy Peterson is our interim um, 
seen ombudsman. So right now the discharge function is going back to each of the local ombudsmen. So if there's a discharge in my area, it is sent to me and then I do the follow up on that. And that's just occurring while she's our, our, uh, our uh, interim ombudsman, but state ombudsman. So the discharge person uh, re receives all of the involuntary discharges notices and those are the notices that say oh you have 30 days to leave and it could be for financial reasons not paying the bill or because you have some behavioral challenges that we don't think we can handle anymore so whoever receives that notice from our office we do follow up with the facility and also follow up with the resident to find out what the resident wants you know if the resident doesn't want to stay there you know we wouldn't you know pursue an appeal but if the resident wants to stay there, then we would advise them of their appeal options and assist through that process. Um, we also assist by providing, you know, names of facilities or other options in wherever area they want to move to. Um, we do attend involuntary discharge appeal hearings, which are all done over the phone. Um, and as far as closures, uh, when we had the travel abilities, we were able to go out to facilities and talk with residents during closures just to make sure that they had a choice of where they wanted to go and we're going where they wanted to go. So a quick example about an admission or sorry, transfer eviction situation. Uh, our office was notified by a family member that the facility said that he needed to find new placements. Um, we realized that the facility told him that but never gave him anything in writing. So the ombudsman met with the director of nursing to discuss the issues that they felt necessitated the involuntary discharge which were behavioral in nature. So the resident would become restless or combative and yell at staff. Um, the om ombudsman reviewed the record and noted that this normally happened only on the weekends. Um, it was also noted that one full-time night nurse was almost always giving a resident two as-needed medications that were not given on the weekends. So, um, so there were any problems during the week and that was contributed to those medications. Um, however, they were given on the weekends, so that's probably why there was an increase in the behavioral concerns. So the facility worked with the physician who ordered one medication to be scheduled daily, and the restlessness was greatly decreased. So um, the resident was able to uh, remain in the, in the facility. I'm going to briefly talk about our volunteer ombudsman program. And... Uh, Right now, we're not currently recruiting volunteer ombudsmen because our volunteer ombudsman coordinator was one of the folks who um, moved on and she's uh, continuing her schooling. So, but right now, uh, all of the local ombudsmen are, are serving as the point person and the support person for a volunteer ombudsman. So a volunteer ombudsman just essentially is an extension of our office who advocates for resident rights, visits at least three hours a month, um, and focuses on quality of life and care. Um, that person has to be a good listener and objective problem solver and uh, demonstrate an understanding of our program practices and not have a conflict of interest either. So anyone over 18 can be a volunteer ombudsman and we have excellent, excellent volunteers. A lot of them who have professional experience and, you know, nursing or health and human services or even long-term care, some who had experience being a family member or a caregiver of someone who, of a family member who lived in long-term care. So the volunteer co communicates complaints to facility staff on behalf of the resident, again, with his or her permission and monitors progress to um, make sure issues are resolved. And volunteer ombudsmen, they do submit monthly reports to our office, which I read each month and, um, you know, document in our system in case there's a case that has been resolved by a volunteer. We put that in so that our volunteers get credit for resolving um, concerns and cases. So a little bit about the Managed Care Ombudsman Program. Um, right now we have a Managed Care Program Coordinator. Her name is Tel Kelly Todd. And we have two managed care ombudsmen, Kelsey Zanting and Pam Hegel. And um, back in July 2015, um, the Office of the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman was um, given uh, the ability to serve as an advocate for Medicaid managed care members who received the managed long-term services and support. So therefore, MCOP is what we call our program. 
for short, was created, and they uh, advocate for rights and wishes for approximately 57,000 Medicaid members receiving care in health care facilities, assisted living, elder group homes, as well as any member um, enrolled in any of the seven Medicaid HCBS waiver programs. Those um, folks in the waivers served would include um, folks participating in the AIDS or HIV waiver, brain injury waiver, the children's mental health waiver, elderly, health and disability, intellectual disability, and physical disability waivers. So the functions of the MCOP folks, they also act, act as advocates for Medicaid managed care members who live or receive care in a healthcare facility, assisted living program, or elder group home. And again, advocate for anyone who's enrolled in one of the seven home and community-based waiver programs. They also investigate complaints made by or on behalf of members. They serve as resources for answering, answering questions about managed care rules and members' rights. And they do provide a lot of information, education, awareness, and training about managed care options. Um, in fact, they just came out with a, a new publication regarding how to advocate for yourself as a managed care member. Um, they also promote policy changes to improve quality of life for the Medicaid managed care members. So when would be a good time to contact the managed care ombudsman program? If you have if you'd like to ask assistance in resolving a concern with an MCO, managed care organization, or to ask for assistance to resolve a concern with a healthcare provider. If someone would like to learn more about rights of, their Medicaid, of the Medicaid members, or to clarify state and local regulations. MCOP folks also pro provide um, information or assistance about a specific top topic, such as the process for choosing um, or changing a managed care organization. They also provide information so folks can learn about resources available to Iowa Medicaid managed care members and their families, um, such as legal assess assistance and advocacy services. And they also handle speaking engagements. A little bit about managed care member rights. Um, they're pretty basic for the most part, but um, managed Medicaid managed care members should be treated with respect and dignity and expect privacy and confidentiality. They should also express concerns without fear or reprisal, um, participate in their care planning process and make decisions about their treatment. Um, members have the right to make personal choices and to be fully informed about services and costs. So that's a little bit about the MCOP folks. Um, and just some, a little additional behind the scenes things that our office does. We do send out uh, a monthly uh, email newsletter to facility administrators and directors in order to highlight issues faced by long-term care residents and tenants. We do create and disseminate multiple informational guidebooks, fact sheets, and consumer checklists. Um, in fiscal year 16, we utilized a civil money penalty grant to produce and distribute kiosks and educational materials to all nursing facilities in Iowa. Um, so those kiosks were like brochures holders, um, and they, they held uh, 12 different brochures. So we wrote brochures on 12 different topics, including living wills, financial exploitation, financial and health care power of attorneys, involuntary discharges, um, long-term care choices, long-term care payment options. Um, our office, Office of the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman, resident rights, we wrote about sexuality, volunteer ombudsman, and resident and family councils. So it was great to get all of that information out and we've heard you know, good feedback from facilities and from residents who have picked up brochures. We, uh, we also issue press releases and provide follow-up discussions on uh, with media on relevant topics. And we do try to keep our, uh, our website updated with pertinent information for residents, caregivers, and providers, and webinars. We have uh, various webinars on our on our website, and we do have a legislative liaison who works with legislators in order to educate them on our office's work and advocate for changes that we feel need to be made in order to enhance quality of the life of life for folks in the long-term care. So that pretty much sums it up with our office. Um, Thank you very much, Pam. Um, I do have a couple of questions to lead us off, and if 
if anyone in the audience has any questions, please feel free to come up to the microphone here on the side so we can get you uh, recorded. Uh, but I, as you were talking, I have a couple of questions. Um, yeah. It occurred to me that for the cases where you're unable to physically go out, like the 2 a.m. bathing or other things, um, and they actually are issues that rise to the level uh, that uh, DIA would be involved. Mm -hmm. um, and so you report it so that they can physically investigate it. Do you feel like there's a level of cost shifting in from your not having a travel budget to an increased change, a percentage change that's almost close to one to one in DIA's travel budget? Would that be a fair question to ask DIA just to see if they're tracking that? That would be a good question for DIA. Okay. I don't know. I know I personally have been making more complaints for them recently. Okay. Um, you said that um, when some residents are looking to return to the community, uh, which falls under the Olmstead Act, uh, and their right to do that, and you contact uh, agencies like Heritage, do you also... Um, being from Johnson County, we have um, eight county coverage from Access to Independence that also does that. Have you worked with them? Yes, I have quite a few times, and they're wonderful. Yeah, okay. I've worked with all kinds of different people, and and for folks on Medicaid too, that's a great part, you know time to bring in the case manager from the medic their MCO. Yes. So bringing them in too has been really helpful and has garnered some good results. Great discharges. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? We do. It'll be just a moment. Okay. And Bob Welch. Um, do you have volunteer ombudsmen in all of the facilities in your seven county area? No. No, absolutely not. I wish we did. I can tell you how many ombudsman volunteers I have. I have 13 total. And how many facilities? All of my uh, you have you to have ask 13. that. 13 total. In my six counties, I only have 13 volunteers. Wow. So most of the facilities in Johnson County do not have volunteer ombudsmen? Well, thankfully, I have a surplus in, in Johnson. I have six volunteer ombudsmen in Johnson County. So, so uh, Johnson and Lynn are my biggest counties where I have, I have six in Johnson, six in Lynn, and just one in Grinnell, Powhatan County. And we did poll the volunteers to see if any of them would be willing to travel um, or go outside the, their county area where they're assigned to. And we've had quite a few say that would be fine. Um, like for my administrator example that I gave, that was in a, a county where nobody said that they wanted to travel to. And it's, you know, at least an hour away, hour and 15 from Seattle. So I unfortunately couldn't ask anyone to go out there. And plus they're volunteers. I don't want to burn them out. You know, they're doing a great job and we want to retain them as, as best we can. Sure. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Oh, I have one other I was uh, wanting to ask. Um, so whether it be long-term care or um, uh, the MCOP, um, are you um, aware of once you make a report to CMS uh, of a complaint, do you have um, does information come back to you about resolution or, or action taken on these complaints? I don't know. I'm not, I really don't know. That's a good question. Has there been a specific complaint that you know of that's been submitted that I can look into? Um, I know in general of general ones, but they're mainly have to do with the MCOs. So we might uh, okay. just reserve that question for our November forum. Okay. And I did check with the MCOP folks ahead of time to see if they had submitted any complaints to CMS. And I don't think that they have. Okay. So I don't know what the response time is or anything like that. All right. Sorry. That's great. Does anyone else have any other questions? 
for Pam today? Well, Pam, I want to thank you for your willingness to um, work with the technology and um, prepare your presentation for us and talk to us about what you do. Um, it's extremely helpful, and, and what you do is very important. So I want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts in Johnson County for all that you do. And I want to thank the Coralville um, and Eric Dickerson and his partner in crime over there for all of their uh, working with our technology to make this happen today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pam. Thank you, Pam. And hopefully we will uh, see you in person next when we can get some things changed. Me right. too. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Too. Bye. I have a for you.